Well, in this second letter, lecture, I'm going to give some examples of this transverse high order nonlinear phenomena in composites. So, I first I have to say you what's a composite and why I select composite to study. Uh, and uh, I'm focused main, uh, only on metal dielectric composites. So it means that I have a dielectric host and I put some nanoparticles there. These particles are metal. Uh, they are silver or gold nanoparticles. And the dielectric could be glasses, polymers, or liquids. So that's the material, the kind of material that I'll be interested in during this talk. And the reason for that is that because the optical response can be controlled just by changing the amount of metallic particles that I have there. Uh, why metal dielect non-composites? Uh, these metallic particles, they behave like uh, optical nanoantennas. It means that uh, uh, I may concentrate the radiation in a nanoantenna, and if I have a, a, an atom, a molecule nearby this antenna, it will feel a, fi a field which is different from the field of the radiation. It will be a field which is due to the a movement of electrons in the metallic particle. So, uh, in this point, any point in here, the local field will be equal to the field of the light multiplied by a factor which depends on the dielectric function of the nanoparticle and the host. Okay, so the electrons in the particle, they oscillate, they create a dipole which is change in time, and so the field will be a composition of the two fields, the applied field plus, uh, I mean, the, op the optical field plus the field created by the, the particles. Uh, this factor, that's called a uh, local, local factor, it depends on the frequency. If I select a frequency such that the real part of this denominator is equal to zero, then I have a resonance in the particle. This is what's called localized surface plasmas. So what I'm going to show you here is a kind of plasmonic in a disordered material. Uh, the field can be very large. For example, for one metallic particle, if I get this uh, equal to zero, I can reach a factor which is about 10, between 10 and uh, 11, uh, and 100. But if I have a, a agglomerate of the particles, then I have a, what's called hot spots. The hot spots are regions between the particles such that the electric field can be very large. It can be order of uh, 10,000 larger than the optical field. So it means that the intensity on those points that goes with the quadratic of the field can be very, very much larger than the incident intensity. So you can do nonlinear optics with, uh, even with the low amplitude fields. Uh, so the optical response may be enhanced due to the contribution of the electrons oscillating in the particle. The more classical example for that are the colloids with uh, silver spherical particles. We prepare these colloids uh, with uh, metallic particles that can be very uh, homogeneous, size very homogeneous. Uh, what you see here is a particle that has a diameter of about three nanometers. And the points there are the distribution of atoms inside the particle. And then you can see that that's a crystalline particle. You can make uh, it quite homogeneous. You see this picture here. The size of the particles can be very, very small. And uh, 
one thing that's very important for particles like that is that uh, the large number of atoms is, are, is in the surface of the particle. For example, for a particle with 4 nanometers that has about 1,500 atoms, 30% of the atoms are in the surface. So it means that th those particles are very sensitive to the environment. So by playing with the environment, I can change also the nonlinear optical properties. Uh, what you see here is the absorbance as a function of wavelength for this kind of colloids. Uh, typically, this silver, they present this resonance, that's the localized surface plasma resonance, in about uh, this region here that's in the blue, 400 nanometers. Of course, it depends of the environment. In order to stabilize the, the colloids, in order to prevent aggregation, we put some molecules around the particle in order to, to prevent this aggregation and change a little bit this resonance, but not much. You see here that the colors can be different of the colloid. We develop uh, ways to make different kind of particles. Those particles that I showed before, those are, were made even by Faraday in century 18. But now you can use chemistry to do other kind of particles, like this uh, metallic nanoshells. They have a core made of silica and a shell made of gold or silver. By changing the thickness of the shell, you can tune the resonance frequency of the plasma. You can see here going from the to the infrared. So I can play with that. Uh, you can also make another kind of, like, uh, for example, nanoprisms. You first you build a sphere, and then you illuminate with different wavelength, and then you can shape this kind of uh, nanoprism you show here. In the case of nanoprism, you see that uh, uh, the resonance is up to the infrared too. So I have a kind of system that have this resonance. It is very strong resonance. You see here that the absorbance is quite large. So uh, the optical nonlinearity of these particles are large, but they are also very fast. Because the, the response, when you have a, a field which is applied not in resonance, the optical response, it depends on the relaxation of the dipoles that you induce in the particle. And the relaxation of these dipoles are of the order of three femtosecond. Three femtosecond is quite difficult to measure, but you can measure using this technique called persistent hole burn that we take uh, both the atomic field. So it's possible to, to estimate, to measure this uh, T2 in order to put a limit. A limit. Uh, so we have a system that has large nonlinearity and has a fast response. And then we come for the subject of the first class. We can do nonlinear optics of these composites. Those are central symmetric media, so there is no even order susceptibility. And then you can write the polariza polarization like that. But in this case, instead of uh, talk in terms of uh, susceptibility of the, of the, the liquid or the, or the particle, I will talk about sus effective susceptibility. Susceptibility of the composite. So chi 3 has two contributions. One which is the chi 3 of the host, for example, the liquid, and the contribution from the nanoparticles. I think it's my telephone. Well, uh, so what I have here is that uh, chi 3 of nanoparticles, the local field factor, that factor that depends on the dielectric function, and F is the concentration of particles. I mean, the number of particles per unit volume. Uh, so that's uh, effective susceptibility. This part here may dominate the other one can be very large with respect to this one, just because of the contribution of the nanoparticles is large. 
that's the local field factor. And then you see that L depends very much of the frequency that you use. And it depends uh, also of the amount of particles that you put in your sample. You may say that, uh, for example, we have a nonlinear refraction, which is a real part of the effective chi tree. So it includes contribution, real part of this, real part of this, and also imaginary part of this, because the local factor can be an imaginary number. This is not a real number. So it means that a real part and imaginary part of this can be mixed. How to measure that? That's a popular technique called Z-scan. Uh, it's based on the self-focusing effect. Suppose that you have a beam focused in some region here. You have a sample, a nonlinear sample that you scan along the focal region. So this sample has a positive refractive index. So when the sample is in the left side of the focus, the focus will be moved to the left side. So it means that the beam which arrives in the far field here will be spread. And then we put a hole in here and collect the transmittance through the hole. Uh, so as the sample is scanning, the transmittance through the hole reduces and then increases again. And you can do some calculation to, in order to prove that the, the difference in transmittance from the peak and from the valve, from the peak to the valve, can be written like that. So normally, this Z-scan technique is used to measure chi tree components. Here, we are extended to measure high order nonlinearities. If instead of doing that, I collect all the light, then measure the transmittance, nonlinear transmittance of the sample. And it goes like that. Around the focus, the transmittance is large, uh, smaller. Because more light is absorbed, so you have two-fold absorption, three-fold absorption, any kind of nonlinear absorption. Okay? So uh, using this technique, I can measure N2, N4, N6, alpha 2, alpha 4, alpha 6. That's all I want to say about this technique. That's a very popular technique now. But this is an example of uh, an experiment. In this case, we have CS2. Again, CS2 that I've mentioned in the first class, uh, mixed with silver nanoparticles. And then what you see here is that the value of N2, when I increase the silver particles, it goes from a positive value, self-focusing, to a negative value, self-defocusing. It goes from positive to negative, passing through zero. So it means that for this concentration of particles, there is no third order nonlinearity. Chi 3 is zero, the effective chi 3. Okay? The imaginary part of the effective chi 3 goes like that, goes from positive, pure CS2, to negative uh, when there is a large concentration of metallic particles. And effective susceptibility can be uh, constructed from that uh, equation that I put before. And measuring the real, real part of the effective susceptibility and the imaginary part of the susceptibility, I can calculate, I can determine what's the uh, susceptibility of the nanoparticle. Okay? So that's one experiment that uh, was done by, by uh, our laboratory several years ago. I think it was in uh, seven. Oh no, in 2007. 2007. Well, what I'm going to show now is that if I increase the intensity of the laser case, we can see uh, also contribution of the order, order. And again, I come with a silver nanoparticle, but in this case in acetone. Acetone has a very small value of chi 3 in comparison with CS2. So it means that in this kind of experiment, the contribution of the nanoparticles is very relevant. And what you see here is that the, the 
Z-scan profile. And you can see here that there is, I changed here the, the amount of uh, nanoparticles, the, what's called the filling fraction of nanoparticles. Here it goes from 0 0.8 10 to minus 4 to 3.0 10 to minus 4. And you see here that the profile changed the, the symmetry. That means that it comes from negative to positive, from positive to negative. The value of the effective nonlinear refraction. Now I'm working with the intent that the high order nonlinearities become important. And you can see this in this uh, uh, figure here that. Uh, if I increase the intensity, in some intensities, uh, the, the, beam is, the shape is not so regular as it was before. And now we have some uh, uh, sign here that there, is other, there are other nonlinearities contributing. And then we measure that, the, the value of uh, refractive index and the absorption coefficient. And what you, what you see here, is the behavior of any two as a function of f, the filling factor. And here we put behavior of any four multiplied by i, by intensity, in order to put in the same scale. And what you can see here is that when any two is zero, any four is different from zero. Now, to remember what we saw uh, in the previous talk, chi three is the first order approximation in the perturbation theory. Chi 5 is the next order. Chi 7 is the other. So when you add other terms, the other term should be smaller than the previous term. But we are here in a very special situation because I have this composite system. The situation is I can have any 2 equal to 0 and any 4 different from 0. No violation of the perturbation theory expansion. Just, I'm playing with those numbers in the expression for effective chi 3 and effective chi 5. So, uh, we can interpret, we can describe this by a model, which is an old model called maxwell garner model. And here, we are generalizing this model in order to include nonlinearities of high order. So, the first case is that one that I showed before. That's for chi 3. You can calculate chi 5, and you can calculate chi 7. In principle, if you are patient enough, then you can go high order. Okay? But then you see that it's more complicated when you go to uh, the uh, orders of a high order. But here you can understand why chi 3, the real part of chi 3 can be zero, and the real part of chi 5 is not zero. Just by looking here, you have contribution of, for effective chi 5, you have a contribution from chi 5 of, of the nanoparticles, but you have also chi 3 contribution and the chi 3 contribution here. So you can have a zero of the real part of chi 3, but you still have some uh, comp, uh, contribution of a real chi 5. And uh, you can have also imaginary part of chi 3 contributing. Although the refractive index associated to chi 3 is zero, the imaginary part is not zero. So you can have this uh, chi 5 different from zero. And the same thing happens to chi 7. You can, you can uh, play with, uh, look, what I did here in order to have this zero of any two was adjust, adjust this, this factor, the filling fraction. In order to have this zero of a uh, real part of chi 5, I have to play with uh, f, and I have also to play with uh, intensities. I can, I'll show you later how the intensity plays a role in here. Okay, so I can have a very exotic kind of material. A material which presents any 2 equal to 0, any 4 different from 0. And I can still play with the concentration and look what happens with the other nonlinearities. So I have a very original, exotic material. 
And then we can do what's called, what we call uh, nonlinearity management, just to copy what people do in atomic physics. Nonlinearity management. That's our procedure to obtain this special composite. And uh, as I showed before, I may have this kind of material with n2 equal to 0, n4 different from 0. I can even have uh, n2, n4 equal to 0, and n6 due to chi7 different from 0. That's what I'm showing here. So I can have a, a material which has chi7 different from 0 and the other contribution equal to 0. No violation of the expansion. Okay? Everything very well behaved. So this effect is a self defocusing due to chi7. That's a very simple experiment. Just play with the concentration, then you have a sample with only chi7, and you pass a beam through, this, through a cell. That's a liquid, that's a colloid. If I pass a beam with a small uh, power, 0.5, that's the size of the beam. But if I increase the power to 40 kilowatts, then you have the beam becomes larger. That's the fact called self-phase modulation. That's not what Paul told you in the first class, because he, he was thinking in terms of a spectrum in frequency. Here, I, I'm working the space, uh, in the space, spatial space. He worked in the time space, or in the frequency, the spectral space. Okay, so that's the self-focus or self-phase modulation. What you can see here, we read this image along this direction, and then you see the red beam, the red uh, trace here corresponds to the a small power, and the blue one to the large power. There was an increase of the, of the diameter of the beam. Uh, if you, uh, this was measured in the far distance. But if I measure, uh, uh, bring the focus of the lens out of the, the cell, I can observe this thing which is typical of a diffraction by one uh, circular. Uh, slit. And then, by doing simple uh, interference calculations, we can reproduce the formation of these rings in this profile. But look, that it's like you have a cell, and the place that you beam is passing, you change the refractive index. It's like in the experiment of uh, undergraduate course. There, you make a hole. Here, we change the refractive index in that region. That's the reason because we have this diffraction uh, pattern here. So that was this effect, which corresponds to a particular value of concentration. Okay, we could have this because at this point we cancel the effect of chi three and chi five. I can show you another example that's called cross phase modulation. Uh, also, Paul mentioned in the first class. If you have two beams propagating, collinear, or even if they make an angle between them, one beam may change the refractive index of that the other beam uh, sees, and vice versa. In this case here, I will consider two beams counter-propagating, passing through a, a system like that. So what I have to do is write the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. In this case, coupled, because you have two fields, and then I have this part here, that's the contribution due to chi-3, effective chi-3. And here I have the contribution due to chi-5. This equation is quite similar to the equations that you have in an in a, a optical fiber area. In, uh, there, they, instead of put in terms of uh, space, they play with time. So in this case, uh, we will do experiments with the beams with different intensities. So you have one beam with larger intensity than the other one, in order to have uh, the effect of one beam on the other and very small intensity from the other beam uh, over the, the first one. The experiment is done like that. Have a, 
because second laser, 532 nanometers, there is a pulse speaker in here in order to select the pulse, in order to have a low repetition rate. And then we come with two beams. Here is a spatial filter in order to make the beam as much uh, Gaussian as possible. And then we separate the beam. Here is a beam splitter. You have a strong beam which goes in this direction and a weak beam which goes in this direction. So what we want to see is that how the profile of the weak beam is modified due, the, due to the presence of the strong one. So the profile of the weak beam can be measured in here in this CCD. Okay. And uh, the ratio between the intensities is uh, this one. One beam is 10 times larger than the other one, the intensity. Just to have one beam strong and the other beam as a probe. And here are the profiles that we observe. Uh, so in this case, uh, the three columns here corresponds to different concentration of particles. The concentration here is quite small. It's 0 0.5, 10 to minus 4. In such case that only chi 3 is important here. In this case here, I have a, a situation in which chi 3, the real part of chi 3 is 0. This part here. And in this part here, I have a concentration large enough to have contribution of chi 3 and chi 5. So the profiles obtained from the images can read here, and then you have these profiles. And here is the theory by solving the couplet uh, equation. And then you see that it's possible to describe very well what's happening with the beam. In particular, Look in this point here that we have N2 equal to 0 and N4 measured by Z scan is another experiment. You can have that uh, uh, describe very well the profile of the beam. So that's uh, one effect which is expected from since a long time, since the beginning of nonlinear optics, but that's the first time that is shown experimentally this kind of spatial modulation instability due to chi 5. Due to chi 3 is very well known. Due to chi 5, you expect also to have that. But due to chi 3 and chi 5, but due to only to chi 5 is this one here. And this is the uh, three dimensional uh, profile of the beam. That experiment was made with two counter propagating beams. The one which I want to, to show you now is, was a cross-phase modulation with co-propagating beam. Situation changed a lot because then in this case, they have contribution of chi 3, chi 5, and chi 7. So you have this couple of equations. Then you have to do some calculations, computer calculation. Uh, Albert Heine is a good student, so he can do these things. I only, I only supervise. He does the, the theory and he does the experiment. He's a good uh, PhD student. And uh, let's see what is the result. In this case, we see a new effect. That's the induced focus due to the seventh order susceptibility. So let me explain what's this. We adjust the concentration of particles in order to have N2 equal to 0, N4 equal to 0, and N6 uh, negative. So it means that if I pass a beam through this material, it behaves like a self-defocusing material due to chi 5. Oh, I'm sorry, due to chi 7. And uh, uh, the experiment was done like that. We have uh, the two beams exactly overlapping. What you see here, the pump beam is the white, the red beam is the probe beam. So we have the pump beam with the peak exact in the, on this, uh, the peak of the red beam. And then you see that the strong beam induce a hole in the probe beam. The probe beam is the red one in the entrance of the, phase, of the cell. The red line, the, the black line, is the reading of this image here. So you see that the strong beam creates this hole 
in the probe beam. Uh, again, this is experiment, this is theory. In this case here, we change a little bit. They are not overlap very well. And what happens is that this strong beam should be the focus. The probe beam does not change much because uh, the intensity is not large. But what you see here, comparing with the beam in the entrance of the cell, is that the strong beam, in fact, induces a reduction, a, a narrowing of the probe beam. The probe beam now is narrowing than it was at the entrance of the cell. So it's a system which is self-defocusing, and we are observing a result of cross-phase modulation where two beams are self-defocused, but the strong beam induces focusing of the probe beam. And again, you can see here that the profile, the theoretical profile, is quite similar to the experimental one. So it means that the nonlinear Schrodinger equation can describe very well exact nonlinear Schrodinger equation extended, modified to include high order uh, nonlinearities. Uh, this picture you saw before, okay, the, in the first class, that's the diffraction that happens, for example, if you have a flashlight like that. You know that you may have self focusing and uh, if we, we combine the two effects, we can have solitons. So let's play with solitons also with this new material. What's the difference between the, what I'm going to show you now is that in the first case, we had a homogeneous material. It was a liquid CS2. In this case, I have a liquid, which is homogeneous, but then we have a metallic particles. So the medium is heterogeneous. Okay? So we look for solitons in here. But in here, I can play with the nonlinearities. You remember that in the first class that we had CS2 with a positive N2, negative N5. Here I can play with uh, different values for that. I can make uh, N2 0, N5 uh, negative. I can do N, N thing. But you remember that in order to observe this uh, soliton in the previous class, I had to have N2 positive and N4 negative in order to have a stabilization of the soliton. So in this case, what uh, I want to show uh, another, this is what we saw in the previous class, okay? So in this case, so in the previous class we had this, N2 positive, real part of chi 5 negative. So the question now, is it possible to observe stable 2 plus 1 D solid in a system where I don't have chi 3, I have chi 5 positive, chi 7 negative. So just uh, pay attention to this. And why enter in this subject? If you look, if you watch in the literature, there are a lot of uh, theoretical papers where uh, uh, people did uh, all theory that you can imagine with a system that were not available for them. So we are the first to do this kind of experiments by playing with the concentration of particles. So uh, in some case, I don't need to, to have a new idea. Just go in the literature, look what the mathematicians did, and then we can do, okay? So what we have to do is just to solve the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Uh, uh, terms that uh, I have to, to, to select, okay? So let's look for that. So that's a nonlinear management. That's the reason because I have this two here. And in this case, I have this. N4 positive and 6 negative, put silver in acetone, and do the experiment. The setup is similar to the one that I showed in the first class. I have the beam passing here, and look for the beam, the transverse direction, and also transmit direction. Uh, and here is the experimental result in comparison with theory. Looking for the side view of the experiment, you see that by changing the intensity of the beam, there is one region here where the beam does not change much. It's collimated up to here. 
Okay? In this region of 70 gigawatts, 75 gigawatts, we have a, a soliton propagate in there, a spatial soliton. But that's a, a spatial soliton very exotic that corresponds to N4 equal to 0 and 6 and N2 equal to 0. Uh, that's one example. Uh, all these results that I am showing you were published in the past two years, okay? In the first class and also here. And uh, that's what we measure uh, in the camera, looking for the uh, beam waste as a function of the position in the cell. By changing the intensity, you can see that the beam waste is constant for a uh, distance, which is about two millimeters in here. And here is the theory that we can, uh, the, the numerical uh, result that you can obtain from the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So everything under control. And uh, uh, this is an, an application. Now I know how to produce a vortex soliton, you remember from the first class. But as I told you in the first class, a vortex soliton is stable if I have a material that's self-defocusing, okay? And then I take a material which is self-defocusing. Which material is this? It's a colloid with metallic particles. N2 is negative, so I propagate a vortex in a liquid. So the, I can propagate a soliton which is stable for long distance. In this case, 10 millimeters. Long distance for people who work in fiber <laughs> would be 10 kilometers. But in my case, uh, 10 millimeters is a very long distance. Okay? Uh, and what we do here is the following. We have two beams. One beam, which is a pulsed beam with large intensity, and another one which is a linear laser. Low power, 5 milliwatts uh, maximum. And then we pass a vortex beam through the sample and uh, discover the conditions to have a soliton. You can see here, uh, this is the beam at the entrance of this, the cell, z equal to 0. At 3 millimeters, 5 and 10 millimeters. And these are corresponding to different intensities. 0 0.1 gigawatts per square centimeter in this line, 3.0 in this line. And what you see here is that I start with the beam with a very small diameter. The bar in here is 50 micrometers. And as the beam propagates, it, it spread. So I don't have a solid one here. The intensity is too small. But for three gigawatts per centimeter, you see that there is almost no change in the profile of the beam. So here I have a vortex solid propagating for a very long distance, 10 millimeters. And then I test the helium nil inside. What's happened? Since the medium is self-defocusing, it means that the region where I have this green beam has a refractive index which is smaller than the original refractive index of the liquid, okay? Because it's self-defocusing. So, the, in the center of the beam, the refractive index, the linear refractive index, is larger than in the, in the part that is illuminated. So I have a situation which is equivalent to an optical fiber. The cladding here is due to the vortex soliton. And then I can pass a beam which is guided through this fiber. Okay? So what you see here is that uh, what I want to show you is that I can pass this red beam that's guided for a certain distance. So that's one application of this uh, uh, soliton. Okay, this is just uh, uh, the side view of this situation here for larger intensity and for small intensity. For small intensity, the beam spread, like you see, and for three gigawatts, the beam passes very, uh, homogene uh, very uh, homogeneous, very uh, collimated here. 
And here is the, the numerical simulation. And here is the result. Uh, what you see here is that the helium new laser in, front, in the front of the cell, uh, as it propagates 0, 3 millimeters, 5 millimeters, 10 millimeters. So only the helium new beam. So it spans when it propagates. What you see here is the helium new passing through the optical vortex. And uh, here is the result measuring the image collect in the CCD camera. Then you see that for 3 millimeters, 5 millimeters, 10 millimeters. So there is some light which is uh, liquid, but ma major part of the uh, red, light, red light is guided by the optical vortex solid. So uh, and in this case, here is the side view of the experiment. The red beam, which uh, is uh, propagating almost, almost all intensity along the, the, the hole of the optical vortex, we have some, we miss some intensity around that. And here is the numerical simulation. And that's the, the, guide, the guided beam for this combination of intensities here. Again, this is a very old proposal, not in the literature, but that's the first time uh, observed. So I changed a little bit. No more solitons. Now the problem is uh, related to optical switching. Uh, in general, uh, people want to have a good material to do optical switching. The good material has to have a large nonlinearity and fast nonlinearity. The problem is that all material that have large refractive index, uh, they have large nonlinear absorption. And we need exactly like that to have this uh, good optical switching. Okay? Because uh, refractive index uh, is associated to absorption by kramer kronger relation. So if you increase the refractive index, then you increase the absorption. So that's the problem for materials. But with this exotic material, then you can find something different. Uh, so let's see what to do. Here is not a colloid anymore. It's a film. It's a morphous film. That's a kind of glass. We have been working with that. And they put some gold nanoparticles. And uh, what you see here is the Ziska. Uh, profile that I mentioned at the beginning of this class. We can measure N2, we can measure alpha 2. And uh, those are the results. There is what's called a figure of merit for all optical switching. And this figure of merit is this uh, coefficient here. N2 divided by lambda and divided by alpha 2. What it means? You want to have a large parameter like that. It means a large N2 is small alpha 2. So the dream that people who does a lot of switching is to have a large number for that. And uh, what I can show you here is that for the film without gold nanoparticles, this parameter is 8.3 10 to minus 4. And for the film with a uh, gold nanoparticles, we have uh, an increase of about two orders of magnitude. It goes from 8.3, 10 to minus 4, to 2 times 10 to minus 1. This is the effect of the local field due to the nanoparticles. And uh, how can we understand that? So we come back to the colloids. And with the colloids, I can define this figure of merit but not in terms of N2 and alpha 2, but in terms of the effective refractive index and the effective nonlinear absorption. And then what we want is to minimize. Here is a, exactly the opposite that I put in the previous slide. In the previous slide, I put N2 over alpha 2. Here I put alpha over N. So I have to have a T 
as small as possible. So I plot here the results for different frequencies, for different uh, uh, intensities, and for different uh, concentration of nanoparticles. And you can see here that I can that's plotted one over t. So what we want to see is to have uh, this number as large as possible. And what you see here is that by going from this point to this point, I have a change of about two orders of magnitude. So it's just a calculation that you can do based on this. Calculate the derivative first order, make it equal to zero, and look for the maximum for that. So you can have this uh, possibility to have a, a optical switching with a composite. Of course, to be a device should not be a colloid like we did, but it's possible to do uh, with a film with metallic particles in there. And the switch will be very fast because it will depend only on the T2 of the nanoparticles. So this result is an uh, interesting result. But in order to answer the question that uh, she, raised in the, she raised in the first class, this is a challenge for material scientists, to make a material with a controlled concentration of nanoparticles. Here, we are just point out what can be done. I don't know how to do it for a material. OK, okay. so that's a summary, I think. Uh, now, Vanderlei did not give me the crystal that he provides. He disappeared. <laughs> okay. So he should give me two crystals, right? Because it was so much time. OK, so uh, I, I, I have what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you could see that uh, with metal composites, I can have a large nonlinear susceptibility. It depends. Ah, I did not show. I did not uh, show an example of that. But it depends also of the shape of the nanoparticle, because the local field depends. Should depend of the shape. You know the the lightning rod effect. Okay. If I have a particle like a prism with some uh, points, so the local field around this point should be larger than around one sphere. So you can play with also with that when you go to prepare this material. <laughs> okay. Instead of putting a sphere, put prisms. So that would be better. So a metallic particle can be nucleated uh, in different medias. I did not uh, show you, but uh, we have been done some uh, simple experiments with luminescence, showing that it's possible to increase very much the luminescence of glasses doped with uh, ions, rare, rare earth ions or uh, uh, metal ions like uh, iron, like uh, nickel, and others. Uh, I did not show you here, but uh, we did experiments uh, the past three years that we have shown that the optical gain in waveguides can be increased due to the presence of the nanoparticles. So you can see that. We use that to operate random lasers and also DFB lasers. Uh, all optical switch, etc. So the control of this volume fraction allowed, allows the suppression or enhancement of the susceptibility. Uh, I would like to, to comment a little bit about these random lasers. Random lasers is not what Vanderlei said to you. Okay? Vanderlei was thinking in terms of uh, conventional lasers. Uh, Next class, I'm going to talk about these random lasers, which are lasers that does not require mirrors. There is no optical cavity, but you have lasers. Of course, you know that there should be this kind of lasers, because there are lasers from different galaxies. Okay, And there is no ET there to put mirrors to make a, an optical cavity. So there might be a other kind of mechanism that allows you to operate a laser. Okay? So next uh, class, I will talk about the propagation of light in uh, uh, highly scattering media. And uh, one example that I'm going to present are these random lasers. I think that for today, 
Uh, that's all that I want to show you. And I want to remind you what I sh have shown you in the previous sec class and now. So you saw that it's possible to have a robust two-dimensional spatial solitons. Uh, I have shown you that uh, it's possible to have two-dimensional solids in quintessential media. I mean, chi 3 suppressor. Uh, we have shown that uh, with um, this nonlinearity management, I can have this uh, observation of spatial phase modulation, uh, modul instability modul uh, modulation instability. Uh, I have shown you that spatial phase modulation due to kit and septimal nonlinearity in metal colloids. Uh, another thing is the optimization of the all-optical switching that uh, I mentioned. Uh, we also observe this robust self-trapping optical vortex beam in saturable medium, that's a CS2. Uh, we also observe how to control the beams that appear when we have a, a vortex beam becoming unstable. And finally, I have shown this, it's possible to guide and confine the light in a kind of a, a temporary waveguide, a guide which exists only when you have this optical vortex propagating. So that's a, a resume of the two classes. So I know that uh, I'm putting very much information for you, but the idea in one school like that is this, okay? You have to be, it's a kind of, uh, when you have a, like in a store, you come there and you see what you have to buy there. So I, I'm showing you what is available. So you take, uh, uh, you know that, and then you, if you like some of these things, you can read the papers or you can come to receive to work, okay? <laughs> So thank you very much for your attention. So any questions? Despite the one that I want to stay in Campinas, not go to Recife and neither San Carlos. <laughs> Everybody's a little bit tired. One question there. Thank you, Professor. Um, I, I want to ask a few questions about the Z-scan results. Um, about what? The Z-scan results. It, you showed, uh, the, I think, about in the, around the slide 48, uh, the variation of the Z-scan signal with the beam power. And um, I, I didn't see a, a linear absorption spectrum of your nanoparticles. Is there a linear absorption? And if so, how do you handle thermal effects? How, the linear absorption is very small. I, I, I have shown you the absorbance of this colloid at the beginning. Okay? Let me come there. Ah, you can see here. Okay, here. Linear absorption is very small if I work here around 500 or if I work with 800 with titanium sapphire. And uh, the other question is how to, how do you handle with thermal effects? Yeah, just work with a very low repetition rate of the laser. If you take one uh, mode locked laser and do the experiment, then you have a lot of thermal effects. So the value of any two will, will be uh, four orders of magnitude larger than the ones that I report here. So our experiment, is done with this uh, uh, selected pulse. We have an optical, uh, somewhere here I, I presented, uh, not here. I have a, a, select, a pulse selector, that's an electron uh, switch. Seven, seven hertz, 10 hertz, not more than that, to be safe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, it's not Sheikh Baha'i model because uh, all the experiment that Sheikh Baha'i did is uh, uh, limited to Chi 3 and Chi 5. We had to generalize that. Okay, one more before I go for. <laughs> Professor, when you measure refractive index and absorption, I see that it is a suspension of gold nanoparticles. 
do at any point of time we check the homogenization of the material uh, homogeneity of the ah yeah that's uh, important uh, as you uh, uh, i don't know if you remember look the size of these particles are quite small maximum uh, the largest particle that i have is about 10 nanometers 10 nanometers it means that it's 50 times is smaller than the light wavelength okay so the scattering the mi scattering is negligible negligible you cannot work with a particle of uh, microns or 100 nanometers because then the material will be too much scattered uh, it will scatter too much light i will talk i will present the results of scattering next class okay but i will not do this kind of uh, uh, measurement that I am presenting here. I present uh, different techniques to measure. It's possible to measure any two uh, in a material which is very much light in a situation that is not uh, uh, efficient for that. I, I will present here the technique for that. Okay. So, oh, no. last one. <laughs> Uh, professor, uh, can you come back uh, for the the focusing, uh, induced the focusing, please? Induce the focusing, so it's yeah. not come back. It's going. Yeah. This one. Yes. Uh, it seems the electromagnetically induced transparency, but in the electromagnetically induced transparency occurs when when the system in, is in the lambda configuration. So uh, I would like to know if is there any condition for the it occurs as in the electromagnetically induced transparency. I don't know too much about the electromagnetic induced transparency, transparency, but I know that you have to have a at least three levels, right? Yeah, at least three levels. Three levels, exactly. and then you have to be in, in resonance with one level yeah. and mm -hmm. to make us uh, to saturate some transitions, uh, things like yes. that. Yeah. In this case, I'm very lo far from a uh, absorber. Uh, 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 there is no resonance in here. I'm, I'm dealing with a, a wavelength that's very far from the resonance, so there is no relation with okay, okay. a. Thank you. AT. Okay, so I think we have to finish because you guys have to run to the uh, bandejão because it closed at seven. So thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, and the motorist and fast side is Thank you very much.